How did you know I was coming to King's Landing? A dear friend told me. Lady Stark. Lord Varys. To see you again after so many years is a blessing. Your poor hands. How did you know I was coming? Knowledge is my trade, my lady. Did you bring the dagger with you by any chance? My little birds are everywhere. Even in the north, they whisper to me the strangest stories. Valerian steel. Do you know whose dagger this is? I must admit I do not. <laughs> well, well, this is an historic day. Something you don't know that I do. There's only one dagger like this in all of the Seven Kingdoms. It's mine. Yours? At least it was, until the tournament on Prince Joffrey's last name day. I bet on Sir Jamie in the jousting, as any sane man would, when the Knight of the Flowers unseated him. I lost this dagger. To whom? Tyrion Lannister, the imp. So in this scene, we learn that Littlefinger's dagger is the smoking gun uh, in an earlier scene where the assassin um, has come in to, quote unquote, finish the job and kill Bran. But of course, uh, Bran's dog, I believe its name is Summer, comes in to to save the boy's uh, life. So let's take apart this scene. So right away, it's set in a brothel. So. Uh, we're in kind of a taboo space. Like, is it even a marginal space? It seems like a lot of your powerful men traverse this traverse this space. But nonetheless, it's a little bit off the grid, and that's why Peter says he's uh, invited Cat there. So, um, Varys, the bald guy, says, "I knew you were coming, Cat, because I trade in knowledge. It's my business uh, to know." And he has the knife. The your material objects, the evidence, but um, the critical piece that he's missing is the knowledge of whose knife it is. So um, there's Peter who has like a, you know, cat in the birdhouse kind of grin on his face. And uh, he knows who the owner of this weapon is because it's he himself, um, even though, ha ha, I'm not the one uh, who tried to assassinate uh your son and he tells this long story about how it wound up to be Tyrion Lannister's um so yeah it's such a complicated web of stories that will become unraveled and re-knotted over the course of this season and subsequent seasons but um nonetheless like what we learn in this exchange is that these two characters are almost like trying to outdo each other in uh the knowledge that they have of the assassination and how many secrets they know so Varys knows quite a few and even surprises cat there in the the whorehouse um but then peter you know, tops it all off by claiming that, you know, I've got the knife, I own the murder weapon, you know, and I'm not the one who was the murderer. So, I mean, that's really quite a whopper of a story. Um, given that they are there in the whorehouse when this goes down, so not to perseverate too much on that uh, scene, but I'm curious about what the relationship between knowledge and secrets is. And I think that that is something important to pay attention to because um, you'll see a lot of these scenes with, you know, spies and secrets uh, information you know, being conveyed in, in whispers and, you know, think about in life how much um, knowledge accrues in value if it's kept secret. Um, and then, boom, like the moment it goes public, there's an impact, but um, then its longevity is uh, kind of less certain. Like, is it more powerful once the bomb has been dropped, so to speak, or is it more powerful as a secret or, um, if you know that a, a bit of information comes from somebody who's good at keeping secrets and doesn't trade in much gossip, um, yeah, you might be more likely to trust that person. Or should you, according to this show, be less likely? Because we have like professional traders in secrets. 
So back when I was coming up in the 80s, there were these infomercials that played during the Saturday morning cartoons known as Schoolhouse Rock. Uh, and they taught people of my generation all about punctuation and how a bill becomes a law um, and quotation marks and conjunctions. And um, they truly were helpful and fascinating and very short, like short enough for a small kid um, not to get bored. So their motto on that show was, uh, knowledge is power. They shout out, uh, during this little, uh, opening sequence, uh, scientia potentia s. So uh, a quote in Latin that's been attributed to the Renaissance philosopher, Francis Bacon, who's living in the 16th century and they're not really walking around. I'm talking in Latin anymore, but it's a sign of his erudition that he, um, penned that quote in, in Latin. Uh, when I talk about knowledge and power relevant to Game of Thrones, I'm not talking about um, the good, wholesome kind of knowledge that we learned on Schoolhouse Rock or the kind of knowledge that you are acquiring in, in university that's going to enrich your mind and your humanity and make you more sensitive and intelligent and curious and socially attuned humans I mean knowledge more like the dirt and the skinny that is used for more practical political purposes. In American and European philosophy, the relationship between knowledge and power is most closely associated with Michel Foucault, uh, who, to boil down uh, his thinking on this matter, uh, all power is in some way based on the management of knowledge. So we have a few questions relevant to um, how this goes down. So uh, we should think um, a good ruler goes about um, setting up an apparatus for acquiring knowledge. And he or she thinks through, how can I use this knowledge? Um, and this involves... Yeah, when do I reveal it and when do I keep it a secret? So it isn't just kind of like, oh, I'm armed with all this knowledge. Like you have to think, gee, um, you know, how do I set up like a network of spies? How do I come by this knowledge? Um, whom do I trust to get it for me? So um, in The Prince, you'll get a bit of an education about how to go about doing that in case you ever want to, uh, you know, step onto the set of Game of Thrones as a, a character in season whatever we're on now. So uh, a couple of key terms relevant to Foucault's ideas about knowledge and power, uh, and I'll just break it down really simply because I think that it does, uh, just the basic lingo is pretty easy to um, master. It's how all these terms uh, go about interrelating and, and circulating. Um, yeah, you'll get uh, an education in this when reading The Prince as well as watching Game of Thrones. And, and think about how this um you know, actually plays out on the, the show, the little bit that you've seen and even your own lives. So um, acquiring knowledge is a way to accrue power because then that person has control over the capital T truth. And by that, I don't mean uh, some kind of exalted and ex abstract notion of truth that um, is, you know, glistening and wonderful and pure and sweet it's more like um you know print the legend to who's got control um you know over the media let's say uh who's got control over quote unquote like history so um we maybe see a bit of that uh in the scene between Circe and Joffrey that um she will purvey a certain narrative relevant to his in that case it's the fight with the dire wolf Do the Dothraki buy their slaves? The Dothraki don't believe in money. Most of their slaves were given to them as gifts. From whom? If you rule a city and you see the horde approaching, you have two choices, pay tribute or fight. An easy choice for most. Of course, sometimes it's not enough. 
Sometimes a Carl feels insulted by the number of slaves he's given. He might think the men too weak or the women too ugly. Sometimes a Carl decides his riders haven't had a good fight in months and need to practice. Gosh, goi, goi, tira, dice! Tell them all to stop. You want the entire horde to stop? For how long? Until I command them otherwise. You're learning to talk like a queen. Not a queen. A Khaleesi. Give command to me. To me. You do not command the dragon. I am lord of the seven kingdoms. I don't take orders from savages or their sluts. Do you hear me? <laughs> Please, please don't hurt him. Tell him I don't want my brother harmed. Kalisi Vosalo Memenem Asisa. Chefke. Well, what? Kill these Dothraki dogs! I am your king! Shall we return to the Kalisa, Kalisi? So in this lengthy scene, we see an interesting study in contrast between uh, Danny and Viserys. So um, both of them use versions of the because I said so argument. So uh, Danny says, I want the horde to stop. And uh, Jorah Mormont says something like, when should we resume and you know when it pleases the queen the khaleesi that's when we'll do it um so she's just by virtue of the power of my office i will turn you guys on and off like a switch um yeah vistress does a similar thing in appealing to his authority but um it's almost like he kind of like joffrey like wants to acquire power or authority just by using it so um i don't know that that's always a terrible idea but in their cases we can see how um especially with viscerous like how it is um like empty and vacant so as they say uh dress for the job you want not the job you have so yeah maybe if he were bossy and brazen enough and went on about how he is the rightful king like yeah at, at some point people you know, will be intimidated by him and by that, um, by that party line. But, uh, yeah, at this point, um, I would say that his claims to the throne and thus his command that the horde resume, um, is not a felicitous statement. So it doesn't have, um, the practical parameters supporting it. It doesn't have a, you know, veritable context. So, um, an example of this is if I, you know, say to any, to people i now pronounce you married um well that's not a felicitous statement because i don't have the power to marry people i'm not a um, minister of justice of the peace etc so um yeah he doesn't have the power to say you know stop horde start again horde um and like i dare say neither would would i so the mere fact that they listen to danny does suggest yeah um she does have um she does have power and so they aren't in westeros where the mad king ruled so whether viscerous is the rightful heir or or not um is a matter of huge debate but yeah he's still kind of grasping for that throne and hoping to reclaim it it isn't yet his um with danny she does come to though 
um, you know, as they say, fake it till you make it, dress for the job you want, not the job you have, that she um, kind of comes to own her power, as one of my friends used to tell me when I was young, you got to own your power. So um, she does just act a little bit more assertively over the course of season one, I dare say. Um, so she does own the office, but that is in part because... Yeah, the office is hers. She is married to the call. Um, and so interesting with her throughout the entire series, and I'll leave it on this note, is that um, she crafts her persona and her power, not as a queen where, yeah, we do have um, yeah, a few other female rulers, and right now Circe is queen of all of uh, the Seven Kingdoms, um, but, you know, she's super-duper powerful, but... With a bit, with a bit of a distance difference. So of course, a Khaleesi is, you know, something equivalent to a queen, but yet it is, um, different. So, Danny is both, you know, equivalent to somebody like Cersei, but then, um, different, and then, you know, for that reason, perhaps a bit, um, dangerous to the um conventional forms of power that we see, uh, going down on the main island.